the reporting choices made by the Middle Eastern press versus the American press, I mean, there was, to say that there was a gap is, uh, I mean, it, it was like the Grand Canyon. I mean, let's just be clear. It was almost as if they were covering two different wars. Hello, I'm Jonathan Tobin, editor-in-chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org, and you are listening to Top Story, a weekly podcast where I analyze the most important stories happening in Jewish news around the world. Each week, I will break down politics, foreign policy, and culture to provide insights into what is going on behind the headlines. Hello, and welcome to Top Story. What happened in May of 2021? To much of the world, the conflict between Israel and Hamas was just another edition of the cycle of violence between Jews and Arabs in which neither side bears more blame than another. Others merely put it down both the controversies that led to the fighting and the subsequent conduct of the war is more evidence that Israel is an apartheid state that commits war crimes against innocent, suffering Palestinians. These are the myths that drive so much of the commentary about the Middle East, and we saw them in operation in real time this past spring, as a series of ginned up disputes were used to justify the firing of more than 4,000 rockets and missiles by terrorist groups in Gaza into Israel and a subsequent surge of anti-Semitism in Europe and even the United States. As for most of the media, they treated it as being caused by Israeli moves in Jerusalem, in Sheikh Jarrah, a property dispute, and action on the Temple Mount. But what was the real cause for what happened? An attempt to understand the reasons for the May War would force us to confront the reality of the Palestinian Authority and its cynical manipulation of its population in order to maintain its corrupt grip on power, as well as to focus on the rivalry between PA leader Mahmoud Abbas's Fatah party and its Hamas rivals, who exercise an iron grip on Gaza. It would also show just how empty the clichés about the necessity for a two-state solution and for Israel to make concessions on the West Bank or to loosen the blockade of Gaza truly are. Or at least it would if the goal were to understand why the Palestinians continue to reject any thought of peace and why Israel's only rationale, rational objective, is to manage a conflict that the other side doesn't wish to end. A look at what happened in May would also force us to confront the changing intellectual landscape of the West and ask why the vituperation and the drumbeat of lies about Israel and its policies seem to be taking on a stronger hold on the chattering classes in the United States, as well as within the left wing of the Democratic Party. The link between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, ideology on the one hand, and fashionable ideologies on the left, such as intersectionality and critical race theory, also explain why attacks on Israel have grown, even as the rationale for the critique of Israel's position has lost credibility. To dive deeper into these issues, we're lucky to have with us today someone who has studied these events closely and is the author of a great new book about the conflict. Jonathan Shanzer is Senior Vice President for Research at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. He's also on the leadership team of FDD's Center of Economic and Financial Power, and he's the author of Gaza Conflict 2021, Hamas, Israel, and 11 Days of War, as well as previous books, including Hamas v. Fatah. He previously worked as a terrorism finance analyst at the U.S. Department of Treasury, where he played an integral role in the designation of numerous terrorist financiers. He has held previous think tank research positions at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and the Middle East Forum. And he's published on these issues widely. Jonathan Shanzer, welcome to Top Story. Thanks, Jonathan. Great to be with you. Well, first, congratulations on the new book. Um, it's very timely and uh, gives us a lot to understand and to, to chew over in terms of these issues. But I want to first ask, you know, let's unravel how this war, this you know, conflict, or whatever you want to, however you wish to characterize it, how it started, and the necessity to strip away some of the myths about what happened last May. And I might add, why are there always these myths about the origins of these flare-ups of fighting with the Palestinians, 
Uh, the other prominent example was the uh, the notion that Ariel Sharon taking a walk on the Temple Mount caused the Second Intifada. What's the pattern behind all of this, and what does it all mean? Sure. Well, first, again, thanks for having me. Um, appreciate the opportunity to chat with you. Uh, look, the the sort of single spark canard is something that's been with us for quite some time that there's you know the, the media coverage of this conflict for whatever reason loves to point to one single moment that sparks these conflicts so you mentioned the Ariel Sharon walk on the Temple Mount as the so-called reason behind the second intifada which was a five-year campaign of suicide bombing and violence against Israel it was coordinated well in advance uh, and included cooperation between Hamas and and uh, Fatah and the PLO, uh, which was remarkable in and of itself. But certainly we learned about the fact afterwards that Arafat had planned uh, to engage in violence as an alternative to staying at the negotiating table um, as the Camp David discussions began to unravel. Um, we could even go back to 1929. Uh, the, the first major riots that occurred in the context of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Um, those riots were, even to this day, they've been blamed on the, on the fact that Jews brought certain articles, religious articles, down to the Western Wall compound. And that was cast by the Mufti of Jerusalem, a guy, by the way, who later went on to collaborate with Hitler. You know, you, the, the Palestinian leadership back then blamed the Israelis for stoking violence and then proceeded to kill hundreds of Jews. So we've seen this over and over again. The Sheikh Jarrah controversy that emerged just before the outbreak of this conflict, I think, fits that similar pattern. Um, this was a real estate dispute that dated back actually almost a century uh, where Jews bought uh, this uh, this real estate. They were eventually kicked out um, after the 1948-1949 War of Independence where the Jordanians occupied Jerusalem. When Israel regained control of the territory in 67, the Arab inhabitants were not ejected. They uh, remained on this property and the Jews sued. Um, the original owners of the property sued, and this has wound its way through Israeli courts for the better part of seven decades with a ruling that was set to come out um, just before the conflict erupted. And that was the purported reason for the conflict. I'll just say here, the idea that a real estate conflict can cause a war is insane, right? I mean, Especially the the one day, where the, the legal owners of the property offer a compromise and the, the people who are squatting on the property say they won't, not only will they not pay rent and, you know, they won't leave. Right. But, but also let's just remember that, you know, um, <laughs> at the end of the day, guns cause war, rockets right. cause war, mm -hmm. bombs cause war, not real estate disputes that are being settled in a legitimate judicial system. And Israel's judicial system is really beyond reproach here. So the idea that somehow this controversy is what stoked this was just asinine. And it was it was remarkable to me that this was repeated um, and just aped throughout the U.S. media and around the world leading up to the conflict. And what was really missing was the fact that just a month before the Palestinians had just canceled elections. Now, why is that important? You mentioned my previous book, Hamas versus Fatah, The Struggle for Palestine. I mentioned I, the, the entire book is a chronicling of a civil war that has been ongoing between the Palestinians since 2007, if not before. Um, and we saw a manifestation of it in the in the lead up to this war where the Palestinians decided they were going to move forward with elections after not having one since 2006. Um, it was a real gamble. It was one that the Biden administration was pushing for. They were calling for Hamas to take part in these elections. Now, mm -hmm. that was a disaster in the making, given that there are laws in the books here in the United States that stipulate that should Hamas win seats and participate in any Palestinian government, it would trigger a cutoff in funding and a, uh, a cutoff in political ties between the United States and the Palestinian Authority. And so as the Palestinians drew closer to those elections, the Biden administration got cold feet. So did the rest of the international community. Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the Palestinian Authority, called it quits on the election. But Hamas was irate. 
This was their moment to take part. They were deprived of that opportunity and they were looking for ways to make themselves look like the leaders of the Palestinian cause. And what better way to do that than to begin firing rockets into Israel, purportedly in defense of Jerusalem. This was exactly Hamas's plan and it got zero attention here in the United States. Yeah, I think you, you've, you've summed up the, this, you know, very well, certainly the context of Sheikh Jarrah, which, you know, to this day continues. And indeed, the Israeli Supreme Court, um, you know, has, has, has offered compromises that allow them to stay, paying a minimal rent. Um, the people who are, have been squatting those homes would rather be thrown out than accept a compromise with Israel, which is sort of the, the entire Israeli-Palestinian conflict in a nutshell. But I guess the question I have to ask, and you alluded to it um, in, in your previous answer, is why so much bad reporting about this? Uh, what, what is your theory on it? I think we all have, have various uh, ideas about it, but you're absolutely right. The New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, most of the, broad, the broadcast networks, they were all playing this, you know, well, they're reacting to, you know, the, the oppression of, uh, of Palestinians in Jerusalem. Uh, line, which was, you know, and, and ignoring the reality of the the rivalry between Hamas and Fatah, which was truly driving it. Why so much bad reporting? Why some, you know, do we call it disinformation? Uh, that's sort of, you know, the fake news is the cliche about bad reporting of our time, but it's really just bad reporting, isn't it? Well, it's bad reporting, but I, I think it's about decisions that are being made. I mean, I'll just say that I, I actually decided to write this book because. I watched this conflict day and night in Hebrew and actually in Arabic as well. And the reporting choices made by the Middle Eastern press versus the American press, I mean, there was, to say that there was a gap is, uh, I mean, it, it was like the Grand Canyon. I mean, let's just be clear. It was almost as if they were covering two different wars in terms of the choices that were being made. So, I, I mean, look, I think we could say bias and we hear that a lot. I don't think bias begins to cover it. I think mm -hmm. fake news is not helpful uh, as a term. I think it's just thrown around too much. I think that the foreign press in Israel has a different mandate, a different objective. I think they have ideas in mind of what should be covered, what needs to be covered. And I think it primarily focuses around the Palestinian issue. Uh, or the so-called Arab street. Um, I think they try to um, bend all the coverage back around to kind of the traditional thinking that, well, gosh, Arabs and Israelis, they just really don't like each other. It's like, I don't know, Tom and Jerry or, you know, the Roadrunner and Wile e. Coyote. They just fight, you know, and, and so we have to cover it, guys. And missing in all of that is the planned aggression, the 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 really the naked violence, the overt attempts at war crimes um, by groups like Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, you know, when, when it happens, Hezbollah. Um, and then there's certainly not a, I think, a, a square look at the fact that a lot of this violence is um, the result of the patronage of regimes like the Islamic Republic in Iran or even Turkey or Qatar, that this is all being stoked from the outside. I mean, I think maybe to sum it up, is we're actually watching the um, uh, the shrinking of the Arab-Israeli conflict as we once knew it, right? This is not the 1948-49 war. This is not 67. It's not 73. We actually are now at a, in a moment where Arab regimes are normalizing with Israel. The West Bank Palestinian Authority, maybe it's not normalizing, but it's pragmatic in its relations with Israel. And the wars that we've seen out of Gaza Right. Then there have been four of them now. They are really being stoked by outside actors. Right. This is a proxy war um, that is being fomented by Iran. And somehow our media has just chosen not to look at this and to only look at the Palestinian Israeli dynamic, which I have to say doesn't really fit the bill any longer. Yeah, I think that that's exactly right. Um, can you go a little deeper for us, um, for, for our listeners and, and viewers? What are the origins of the Hamas versus Fatah rivalry? How, how deep does it go? Um, and is it is it just about power or how much of it is ideology and how much of it is sort of Palestinian politics? 
Well, it's certainly Machiavellian, but there is a, a, a good bit of ideology mixed in there. I mean, I think the way to describe it is, so it all begins in, in 1987, the Intifada breaks out. This is the first Palestinian uprising, mm -hmm. um, a very spontaneous one at that. And the PLO, Yasser Arafat, is they're all in exile in Tunisia. And so the uprising takes on a more organic form. And there are people that are out there, you know, uh, protesting against Israel, engaging in violence. And the PLO is on the outside looking in. A group called Hamas emerges in early 1988. They are Islamist. They are an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, it looks like they're about to take leadership of the Palestinian people. And that's when Yasser Arafat says, wait a minute. I'm going to make peace with Israel. I'm going to engage in the Oslo process. I don't think he did it because he wanted to celebrate Hanukkah with the Israelis. I don't think he did it because he was Zionist in nature. Did it because he realized he was going to lose power. Now, Hamas understands this and they're furious about it, that they've been supplanted by Arafat. And that's when we begin to see the violence against Israel really begin to tick up in the 1990s. Now, the reporting all suggests that it was, you know, um, Hamas just trying to destroy as, uh, as much of Israel as they could, kill as many Jews as possible. I think that's true, but there was another element of that, and that is that uh, they were competing with the PLO, and that was their way of doing it, was through violence. Now, all this comes to a boil in, in 2000 as Arafat thinks about negotiating a final deal with Israel under the auspices of the Clinton administration. He decides not to do it and instead decides to wage the second intifada. This is a this is that campaign of suicide bombings against Israel. And um, as a result, chaos just engulfs the West Bank and the Gaza Strip to try to bring some order to all of that. Uh, President George W. Bush encourages elections. You got to remember, Bush was a guy that thought that democracy was the answer to all terrorism, all problems in the Middle East. And so he actually encourages elections between Hamas and Fatah. Everybody thinks Fatah is going to win. Everybody thinks the, the so-called good guys. I'm not sure we can call them that. But everybody thinks that Fatah is going to win. Hamas wins instead. It leads to a standoff, a political standoff, where the U.S. doesn't want to let Hamas form a government. And that leads to a brutal civil war of 2007, where Hamas takes control of the Gaza Strip by force. And we have been in a state of civil war between the West Bank and the Gaza Strip ever since. So we're looking now at 14 years of civil war. It is entrenched. It is a permanent component of the Palestinian political dynamic. Um, there's definitely ideology. It's Islamism versus kind of straightforward nationalism, but it is also very much a raw Machiavellian power struggle. What's the end game between these two? Or is there an end game between these two? Because um, it, it certainly doesn't, it doesn't seem capable of, uh, of resolution. They keep um, agreeing to uh, unify, but nobody takes that seriously and they do nothing to advance it. At times they move towards elections, as you say, but uh, Abbas certainly doesn't, <laughs> doesn't want to risk uh, losing to Hamas. Um, is there a way for this to be resolved? Because clearly, you know, this is the obstacle to peace. I mean, I think the obstacles to peace go deeper in Palestinian political culture. And part of that is, as, as you know, as, as you noted, um, they compete by uh, engaging in violence against Israel and the Jews. That's how they gain political credibility, which is sort of a bizarro political world, a political culture of theirs. But where does it end? And assuming that Israel were ever to sort of take the advice of the United States and withdraw from much of the West Bank, would they not just be faced, as, as certainly many in Israel fear, with a repeat of what happened in Gaza in just the much larger, more strategic West Bank? Yeah, I mean, on that last point, 100 um, percent, the only reason why Mahmoud Abbas and the Palestinian Authority are still in control of the West Bank is because Israel's there. Um, now, this isn't to say that Israel has a mandate to build as many settlements as it wants. We can debate that. But what I would say is that it's the security 
coordination and cooperation that takes place between Israel and the Palestinian Authority that has prevented Hamas from taking over. That is very much what Hamas aspires to do. There are still cells of Hamas that are throughout the West Bank. In fact, there was one significant network that was just recently disrupted with links back to Turkey. The Israelis um, you know, captured a lot of operatives as well as weapons. And it's a sign of what would happen if Israel was not there. Now, in terms of the end game, you know, that's that's complicated. I would argue that in order for the two state solution to even have a snowball's chance in hell, you need to have unity among the Palestinians. I think, you know, we can probably agree on that, that right now you have the equivalent of a three state solution. Right. You've got the West Bank. We call it West Bankistan. Right. I mean, it's independent. Right. It operates under the, the control of the PA. Then you've got Hamasistan in the Gaza Strip. That is also completely under the control of Gaza of Hamas, rather. And um, and, and they operate very differently. They've got two different political systems. They have two, two different sources of funding. They've got different education systems, security you name it. As uh, Aaron David Miller once put it, they're the Noah's Ark um, uh, of, uh, of the Palestinian National Project. Two of everything, right? Um, and then you've got Israel in the middle. So if you want to get back to the two-state paradigm, you have to figure out how to bridge that gap, how to find common leadership. Um, it does not look likely right now. But if you're able to somehow do that, then you can begin to start having discussions again about a West Bank, uh, Gaza Strip, Palestinian authority that could one day become home to the Palestinian National Project. Right now, it's almost impossible to imagine. Yeah, because the, the gap between the two sides is just enormous. As you say, there's ideology um, and there's personal rivalries. I mean, certainly Abbas, who's in his mid-80s and who's serving, what, the uh, 17th year of the four-year term to which he was elected as PA president, um, you know, he will go someday. He's not immortal, although maybe he and Benjamin Netanyahu will just continue forever. Um, that, that's certainly the way they seem to think. But um, there's really no, you know, even if when Abbas goes, as someday he must, he'll just be replaced by somebody else who's afraid of Hamas. And, you know, you mentioned um, security cooperation on the West Bank, which is a, which is real. Um, usually when people on the Israeli left or the Jewish left speak of this, they speak about it as if um, Fatah and the Palestinian Authority are doing this great favor for Israel. In reality, isn't it? You, uh, uh, there is some help that comes from that side. Certainly they're eager to betray their Hamas cousins uh, to, to Israel. Um, but isn't, isn't most of the security cooperation about securing Abbas and Fatah not about securing Israel and Jewish settlements or, or, or the security of Israel. Absolutely. And I, I think it's been turned upside down by detractors of Israel. Um, yeah, not surprisingly. Um, but but absolutely, you know, ever since the civil war erupted, ever since 2007, uh, Hamas has tried to bring down the Palestinian Authority. They have tried to uh, expand their military and political control in the West Bank. The Israelis work closely and qu but quietly um, with the Palestinians in order to keep Abu Mazen in place. But that actually leads to a different dynamic that I think is worth noting here. And that is, I mean, you mentioned Mahmoud Abbas being, you know, 17 years into a four year term. Um, you know, the guy's furniture inside the Mukata compound. He's definitely not mm. going anywhere until they have to carry him out feet, feet first. But what's happened is because the U.S. has been so fearful of a Hamas takeover um, and because Israel's been so fearful of a Hamas takeover, the only thing that is being asked of Mahmoud Abbas is that he simply stay where he is. And what that's led to is rampant corruption. All right, we've seen Mahmoud Abbas. He started out, by the way, when he first came to power after Yasser Arafat died in uh, November 2004. Abbas came to power shortly thereafter, and he was actually seen as a reformer. He was seen as the guy that was the mm -hmm. anti-Arafat, right? And and, and that well, he wore a perhaps... suit, not army fatigues. That was that was correct. The start, right? Correct. And he didn't have blood on his hands the way that Arafat had leading up to his time as Palestinian president. But the fact is, is that over time, and, you know, we're now talking, you know, uh, almost two decades. A long time. A very long yes, time. Yes. Right. Now, what's happened is, is that this guy 
has solidified power. He refuses to allow others to challenge him, even through legitimate political processes. Um, actually, uh, Yasser Arafat's nephew tried to pull together an election list leading up to those canceled uh, April elections, and uh, Abbas kicked him out of the Fatah party. I mean, they are mm -hmm. they are at odds with one another because this guy dared to create a new political faction. And this has been part of the problem. The other part of it is that Mahmoud Abbas and his cronies, his inner circle, have built the Palestinian Authority. You know, the United States gives the Palestinian Authority something like six hundred million dollars a year. And a lot of that somehow trickles into the pockets of Abbas's inner circle. And so what we have is really a choice right now for the Palestinians, and it's not much of a choice at all between Islamism and violence on the one hand and utter corruption on the other. And um, this is not a good uh, trajectory for Palestinian nationalism, to put it mildly. And again, you know, getting back to this sort of a initial framing of this, it's not well covered. You don't see people looking at the flaws within the Palestinian Authority itself. Journalists don't seem terribly interested in that. But, you know, introduce to them a real estate controversy in East Jerusalem, they'll jump on it. Um, you know, uh, expose to them a new settlement that's built, and you might see that in the press for, for three weeks running. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's clearly true. Um, and I guess there, you know, I, I think you, you've summed it up well. Um, the gap is there between these two, two rivals, and there's just no bridging it within the foreseeable future. But let's turn to something you've already introduced us to, and that is the factor of Iran. Now, a lot of the discussion, most of the discussion about Iran right now is about its nuclear uh, program, its ability to face down the Biden administration. Um, we haven't been talking too much lately um, in, in most of the media uh, about its role behind the scenes in the conflict between Israel and and. Hamas and what's going on in the West Bank. Tell us about exactly how Iran played a role in fomenting the recent fighting the, from last May. Well, I think, first of all, to understand how they uh, played a role in the most recent conflict, you have to understand the history of Hamas's largesse, um, mm -hmm. or Iran's largesse to Hamas. You know, from the very early stages of Hamas's existence, you had training from Iran, um, you had weaponry being transferred and smuggled into the Palestinian territories, um, rockets over time, the training of commandos, UAVs, it's all been provided through Iran. Um, you know, over the years, and we've seen this through US Treasury designations, you know, uh, notices that come with sanctions, um, as well as the testimony of CIA directors, treasury officials, etc. We're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars that Iran has provided Hamas over the years. And what that's amounted to is know-how. In other words, in some cases, yes, they handed the man the fish, but in many cases, they actually taught mm -hmm. them how to fish, so to speak, <laughs> right? And so what's happened is, is that Hamas coming into this war, they've had three previous rounds with Israel, um, this fourth round, they actually didn't need a lot of direct assistance from Iran. They had received a ton of training and weaponry over the years. In some cases, weapon parts. In some cases, weapons themselves. In some cases, it's been engineering in terms of the tunnels, um, the rocket know-how. All of it has come by way of Iran over the years. And uh, so when the war erupted, it was almost certainly a choice made by the Hamas leadership external, internal, military, political. It's a consensus-based organization. Iran may have been encouraging it because Iran, by the way, had been taking its lumps from the Israelis in this asymmetric war that's been going on over the mm -hmm. last several years. And we can touch on that if you'd like. But basically, you know, Hamas decides to start this war and almost everything that we saw, the rockets, the tunnels, uh, the UAVs, the underwater UAVs, it all got there with the help of Iran, whether by money or by direct provision. And, um, you know, so I think there's been an attempt to say, well, Iran didn't have its fingerprints on this. That's absolutely not true. I mean, the group exists because of Iran. It is it would not be able to fight without Iran. And so Iran cheered it on. We saw a lot of rhetorical support maybe some fingerprints here and there in there in terms of direct military provision of rocket variants and things like that. But a lot of this was just waged by Hamas with that quiet guiding hand of Iran 
well behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And also always with the threat that it will use its auxiliaries in Lebanon, uh, Hezbollah, to to augment the struggle. Um, Obviously, there's a completely different dynamic in Lebanon with Lebanese really fearful of being dragged into another war. Um, But Hamas um, certainly is linked to Iran, Islamic Jihad, the smaller component in Gaza, they're directly linked to to Iran as well. Um, What's Iran's goal other than just to keep the pot stirring, to keep pressure on Israel? Oh, I mean, I I think there are a couple things here. I mean, one is at some point um, along the way, Iran's supreme leader has said that it wants to turn Tel Aviv into Seoul. Um, Mm -hmm. And by that, we mean having hundreds of thousands of rockets threatening Israel's largest city. And, you know, we see 150,000 rockets. A reference, to, you're, you're, just for those who didn't catch that, a reference to, to the capital of South Korea, which is correct. under fire from, under from, North, Korea. from North Korea. Correct. Mm-hmm. Sorry about that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, so, and so you've got 150,000 rockets, um, you know, facing south from Lebanon. You've got, let's say, 15,000 rockets um, from Gaza. You've got, by the way, also Shiite militias subservient to Iran that are based in Syria that Israel is constantly trying to knock out. And they've actually taken out thousands of targets since roughly 2013, 2014. Um, but really, that's that's kind of the immediate goal. And they're, they're playing a slow um, kind of game of chess, or if you're familiar with the, um, the Chinese game, Go. Um, you know, the idea is to surround your enemy and smother your enemy. And and I think that's what the Iranians are trying to do in the Levant. But also they use it as leverage um, that, you know, as they're negotiating a nuclear deal with the Biden administration, and the Biden administration is just desperate to throw sanctions relief uh, in Iran's direction in the hope that they somehow return to the JCPOA, the deeply flawed 2015 nuclear deal. Um, but the, the Iranians see all of this proxy activity as leverage. And, and by the way, I would include this proxy activity to, I, I would expand it out to also say that what they're doing in Yemen with the Houthi um, militia, the Iran-backed Houthi militia, uh, stirring up the pot over there, some of the unrest that we see in places like Bahrain, definitely the kind of leverage that Iran has maintained in Iraq, certainly in Syria, right? I mean, it has created a mess across the Middle East. It has the leverage, and I think it's trying to cash in on that um, with mm-hmm. the United States and the world powers that are really looking at this point. I mean, they're obsequious. They're bending over backwards right now to try to appease the Iranian regime, seeing the kind of damage that it can create with a nuclear weapon or without. Um, mm-hmm. And by the way, I'll also just note, maybe just as a, a maybe some punctuation here, the nuclear weapon Yes, they could try to use it against Israel, and I think it's a real threat. But there is a lot of talk in the Israeli military establishment that that nuclear weapon is an umbrella for all of this proxy activity. In other words, mm-hmm. you know, Iran will feel safer having that nuke, knowing that Israel or Saudi or any of these other countries will not respond if they have that ultimate insurance policy. And, and so you can see how all of this is sort of it fits hand in glove. Yeah, I think I think it's that's very uh, you know that's very likely. Um, you would question how irrational do you think the leaders of Iran truly are, and that's always been a question that Israel and frankly the rest of the West has to to deal with. But is Iran is also the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism, and they want a nuclear umbrella for for that. Uh, I, I think that's that's uh, that's a pretty obvious conclusion. Um, much of the coverage, um, much of the bad coverage of, of the conflict with Hamas this past year and in past conflicts of well, always focuses on casualties, um, what is seen as a disproportionate number of Palestinians who are killed and wounded as opposed to a smaller number of Israelis, and the amount of damage that's done in Gaza. Now, interestingly, I think there, was, there were far fewer Palestinian casualties um, in, in this past conflict than, say, in 2014, the last really major flare-up. Um, and yet the, the, the anger, the, the, the accusations against Israel seem to be even greater than in 2014. Um, how, much, how much distortion, how, how bad is the reporting about casualties and, and, and uh, damage? 
uh, how uh, it turned out to be. Let's let's first just look at, at that you know infamous now um, front page of the New York Times where they posted mm. the faces of uh, you know uh, of the casualties from from the war um, on the Palestinian side. Amazing that they would do that uh, for a number of reasons. I mean, number one, Hamas actually started the war. Um, mm-hmm. Israel defends itself, um, you know, keeps the casualty count low, incredibly low. We can talk about how they do that. Um, but there are also a, a large number of, of people that they put on the front cover of that New York Times that um, there were actually militants. Um, right. And, and Hamas, Hamas were, operatives. Correct. Not it was civilians. as if they were memorializing, uh, you know, these Hamas fighters on the front page of the New York Times. It was a pretty mm-hmm. bad look. Um, but, you know, if you, let's back up for a minute. I mean, first of all, you know, I think the way that these conflicts are usually described is that, you know, uh, Hamas fires these firecracker type rockets into Israel. They don't do a lot of damage. And then Israel gets angry and then just starts laying waste to the Gaza Strip. I think that's kind of the way that this has been described. First, let me just say about the firecrackers. On, I think it was the second day of the conflict. I was watching Israeli TV and um, they, they all, all of a sudden cut to the Ashkelon pipeline. And I actually talk about this for a few pages in my book. The Hamas um, fighters were very lucky. They were able to somehow fire a mortar, not even a rocket, it, at the Ashkelon gas pipeline. This is Israel's energy link to the world, basically. And um, they scored a direct hit on a container, actually belonged to the UAE, as we now understand it. And it sent fireballs reaching into the sky for hours. Israeli firefighters had to try to contain this. I believe the entire episode is um, still under gag order in Israel, but mm-hmm. the fact remains is that these are not firecrackers. They can do a hell of a lot of damage, and people just don't like to talk about this, that Hamas, at the end of the day, actually aspires to war crimes. They fire these rockets into populated areas. They try to hit infrastructure, and, and then when they don't, and then Israel responds by taking out the militants, then mm. they start to cry war crimes, right? And right. it's really a crazy dynamic that this even takes place. But let's unpack this just a little bit further. What people also, I think, don't realize, and, and you really have to study these conflicts to get, a, I think, a full appreciation of this, that Israel doesn't just start firing in response when Hamas begins to unleash these volleys of rockets. They actually have what's known as a target bank. And I can tell you that, that, that Hamas targets are accruing right now within the IDF and the Shin Bet, the internal security services. They're building out a new target bank as we speak. These are legal targets approved by IDF and Ministry of Justice lawyers that are um, effectively just delineating what is fair game and what is not. And the idea is that when a war will erupt, that Israel has legitimate targets, they're going to take out military um, assets of Hamas. And that's what we see when these wars begin, right? That Israel unleashes, these are all approved targets, and the goal is to minimize casualties as much as possible. You're using precision guided munitions, while all the, at the same time protecting Israelis with Iron Dome. And that, I think, is the last point that's worth noting here. Iron Dome is... You know, I think it's it's miraculous. I think we can agree that this mm-hmm. missile defense system has saved thousands of lives. But what's I think not often noted is that it saves Palestinian lives too, and not because Israel's uh, you know knocking out the rockets that are going to fall back into the Gaza Strip because they were misfired, but it's actually because the Israelis through Iron Dome are able to take a beat. Well, even while they're under attack, four thousand rockets, they can take a deep breath and decide how they want to conduct the war that they are fighting. They don't feel the anger, the outrage, the necessity to uh, respond in kind with every attack because the attacks are not getting through. And so at the end of the day, you're looking at an incredibly precise, legal and safe operation. Now, you know, 200 something people died during this conflict. That's all horrific. And of course, we lament every loss of human life. But there were 4,000 rockets fired from the Gaza side. There were probably three times that fired on the Israelis by the Israelis back into the Gaza Strip. And we had minimal damage 
minimal casualties, not a lot of collateral damage. And that is just unbelievable. From when you look at how the Israelis wage these wars, they are incredibly careful. And I'm just shocked that Israel doesn't let more people into their war rooms so they can see for themselves the great care that is taken to yeah. wage these wars. It's a very complicated process, and indeed many in the Israeli military, you know, sort of chafe at the at the you know blinders and the, the you know the, the the breaks that are put on their efforts to to attack the terrorists. But um, that's that's clearly something that is underreported. Um, as you an- analyze the Israel Israeli response. What were its failures in terms of dealing with Hamas and dealing with was was it adequately were the Israeli defense forces adequately prepared, and was its effort to get its story across to the world um, did that fail or was there some success? Um, look, there was one. I, I, let's call it an intelligence failure, um, and it actually had nothing to do with Hamas, or at least I don't think it did. Um, and that was the riots that took place in the so-called mixed cities inside Israel. The Israelis mm-hmm. were absolutely not prepared for it. And every official that I talked to during the conflict, you know, seemed to say, look, we're ready for everything that Hamas brought to this conflict, uh, to this round, whether it was the jamming of the Iron Dome at the, in the Jala Tower, which the Israelis destroyed, or it was the metro system of um, underground tunnels that they had prepared uh, to mm-hmm. attack Israel in the event of a ground invasion. All of these things the Israelis were ready for, and they had that target bank, and it was incredibly accurate, and the, the, the munitions they used minimized casualties. So, you know, there was one blind spot. The Israelis dealt with it. I think they're going to have to deal with it for quite some time. I think that was probably one of the more complex issues to emerge as something to watch, is that there is some, you know, real unrest in these Arab cities. By the way, you know, we're seeing a huge spike in the murder rate among Arab Israelis themselves. And we also understand that a lot of the weaponry is coming in by way of Hezbollah. So it's interesting. Maybe Iran is trying to foment this by way of proxy. We don't know yet. Mm. There's a lot that I think needs to be learned. But the Israelis themselves, you know, once again, I think fell flat on their faces in terms of what they call Hasbara which, mm-hmm. you know, is explaining the Israeli perspective. Hasbara literally means explaining. And um, I think they they just, they, they don't do a good job of setting the table, knowing that these things erupt every three or four or five years. Um, you know, they had seven years between the last round and this one, 2014 was the last conflict, mm-hmm. and yet they didn't do any better. Um, and, uh, you know, part of it, and I, I, I picked up something from one senior Israeli official that I had never heard before, and maybe this explains some of it. And that is that when these wars break out, the Israelis are so concerned about a two or three front war that they are primarily messaging to their enemies, right? They're baring their teeth at Hezbollah, at Syria, at Iran, at maybe other Arab states. Uh, for fear that they may want to join the conflict and that we could see kind of a 1973 war style war erupt and then the Israelis would find themselves really on their back feet. And so while they're sitting there telling everybody that they have this thing totally in command and they're going to vanquish their enemies, they're not speaking to their potential supporters or for people that might be a bit more sympathetic to the Israeli predicament. And that may have something to do with it. But I think I have to say, you know, I'm I'm sure you probably feel the same way. You've watched enough of these over the years. They've not learned. They've not learned how to message what's going on. They've not been able to message their precision. Um, And it's it's certainly not helped by the, the media. We've discussed how just poorly they covered it. It's also, you know, this time around, we saw really, you know, negative comments coming out of the American Congress. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, the so-called squad, or as we now like to call them, the Hamas caucus, you know, mm-hmm. joining the fray. And I think, you know, uh, really generating additional negative coverage and the Israelis responding in kind to American lawmakers and, and, and really locking horns with them. I don't think also really helped their, um, their 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 image. I think it probably made it look worse, too. Yeah. So um, but, you know, war's hell, as they say. And if the worst thing that Israel has to endure is some poor um, media coverage, but ultimately end up safer and winning the war, I think um, they're better off for it. 
Yeah, they, they like holding the high ground as opposed to the moral high ground. But I think Correct. you're right about the failure of, of Israel's information policy. It's endemic. I think it's almost cultural because it, it, I think it's, it's partly of a, a national ethos of not caring what other people think about them, but then not being happy about what people do say about them. Um, but I do want to focus in the few minutes we have left on something you just alluded to, which is the reaction inside the United States. Um, uh, the contrast between 2014 and 2021 was that the war was actually much smaller scale. Palestinian casualties, Palestinian damage was far less. But it seemed to me, from my perspective reporting about it, that the vituperation against Israel was greater than in 2014. And indeed, as, as you alluded to, we had people on the floor of the United States Congress engaging in blatant lies and smears of Israel in a way that we'd never seen before. And I, I personally think it's, it's about a change within, you know, within American political culture in which sort of intersectionality and critical race theory have sort of taken over the left wing of the Democratic Party and legitimized this sort of anti-Zionist, anti-Israel position in a way that it's never been legitimized before. And that has really, you know, that's leached into the sort of pop culture, the late night comedians, and also um, played a part in, in news coverage. And so just give me your take on like how big of a disaster, how, how much of a sea change is this, you know, sort of um, change in the chattering classes in the United States um, to, to Israel's detriment? Oh, I mean, I think it's a big problem. I think the, the so-called woke movement is toxic um, in, in, in terms of the, the way that Israel is now um, situated within the uh, discussion here in the United States. It's a huge problem that I think the Israelis are, are beginning to come to grips with. I mean, part of the problem is, is that, you know, this woke culture, I think in many ways was a response, or at least it was, a, it, let's put it this way, it was exacerbated by the presidency of Donald Trump. Trump, of course, had an excellent relationship with Benjamin Netanyahu and, and in general was, you know, uh, roundly applauded by the Israelis for a number of policies that I think were helpful to America, but also helpful to Israel. But that doesn't matter. You know, I think here in the United States, you know, you've got the, the left and the anti-Trump, um, you know, uh, political factions, let's call them, um, that looked at, uh, dimly upon Israel for this relationship. And so um, and they were already geared toward that anti-Israel invective. And so I think it's only been exacerbated um, by the anti-Trump movement. And then I think also by the sort of general woke culture that continues to proliferate here in the United States. Um, and so I think Israel is coming to grips with it, I think. And it's one of the reasons why you see people like um, Naftali Bennett, even right now. I mean, he's actually introduced the environment as a core pillar of, of Israel's national security policy. Um, you know, it is absolutely a nod to um to the, let's say, the political priorities of the left here in the United States. The Israelis are doing a lot more outreach to um, democratic lawmakers, and they're doing their best to try to keep a lid on whatever disagreements they may have right now with the Biden administration, particularly on Iran, even as this really negatively impacts Israel's bottom line in terms of national security. They're doing everything they can to try to keep this relationship held together with duct tape so that they can try to repair the bipartisanship of um, you know Israel's support here in the United States. They've got a challenge in front of them. And I do think that there are, um, unfortunately, I think there's some anti-Semitic undertones, even overtones for what we're seeing mm -hmm. in our political culture. Um, but the Israelis are doing what they have to, which is just trying to rebuild, trying to find common ground. Um, I think they've just got a tough road ahead. Yeah, I think that's um, I think that's entirely true. Um, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the way Israel um, about that issue and the future of the relationship? Um, you know, that's it's a big issue. You know, it's a big issue. Obviously, it depends on who's in power in Washington, who's in power in Jerusalem. But, you know, what's the next step? Well, you know, when can, you know, we can always say, um, you know, Israeli military talk about mowing the grass, that you know, this is just a conflict that's managed. Sooner or later, there'll be another outbreak of fighting. Do you think that's true? And how does that go? Does it get worse? How does that affect the U.S.-Israel relationship? 
Well, there, there are always going to be more conflicts. I mean, unfortunately, this is just it's the history of Israel, as you know, Jonathan. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we, we there's a conflict every few years, whether it's a major war or a minor war. I think, thankfully, we've only seen minor wars, but we may be. Um, you know, on our way to a, a, a bigger one, if in fact Iran tries to make that dash to a nuclear weapon. And we're certainly mm -hmm. seeing signs right now that the Iranians may be stepping up some of their efforts to enrich uranium at weapons grade. And the Israelis are actually sharing intelligence just in the last couple of days about um, uh, intelligence that they've received about Iran's efforts to deliberately produce a nuclear weapon. This is really some new information that's coming to light and I think causing a lot of concern. The Israelis will not sit on their hands. And if a major mm -hmm. war erupts as a result of this, you can only imagine what this will do to the American left, the woke left, so to speak. You know, these are the same people that have been saying that they want to end forever wars. They want to get us out of the Middle East. You know, I would call it a, a sort of a strain of neo-isolationism. And mm -hmm. the Israelis, by just taking care of their own national security, may disrupt some of these plans. And so I can imagine that if we end up at that place, and I sincerely hope we don't for lots of reasons, but I can imagine the Israelis will take a lot of heat. And by the way, I would also just say that I suspect Iran knows this. And it's one of the hedges that they have um, in this sort of chicken game that they're playing with the Israelis as we speak. Well, I think that's very true. Um... Jonathan, thanks so much for your insights. You've given us uh, a lot to think about. Um, uh, people do read um, Jonathan Shanzer's new book, uh, Gaza Conflict 2021, Hamas, Israel, and 11 Days of War. I think you go into great, in, you know, great detail. And um, if you want to know more about what just happened and what may be happening in the future, read that book. Um, thank you, Jonathan, for coming on. And thank you, thank you to our audience uh, for tuning in whether you're watching on JNS's YouTube channel or listening to us on Spotify or all the various uh, podcast uh, channels, wherever you listen to podcasts, please like, subscribe, uh, give us good reviews, uh, give us feedback about what we're doing, and we'll look forward to seeing you again next week. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode brought to you by the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org. Visit us at JNS.org and please follow at Amazon and Spotify wherever you listen to podcasts.